Bank International, now open at 208 South LaSalle Street in Chicago, the English Bank with the American accent, now presents on WFMT The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight we begin broadcasting the last of our special three-part Sherlock Holmes stories, and here's the beginning of The Hound of the Baskerville. <laughs> within the hour. I checked all the facts that were mentioned at the inquest, the footprints, the absence of physical injury, the facial contortion. He said there were no traces on the ground round the body. He didn't see any. I did. Footprints? A man's or a woman's? Mr. Holmes. They were the footprints of a gigantic hound. <laughs> And so began perhaps the most terrifying of all the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. My name is Watson, Dr. Watson, and it was my privilege to share them. But if ever I felt it a doubtful privilege, it was in this our encounter with the Hound of the Baskerville. I will tell you what happened. In the fog last week, I caught this dreadful cold. Please excuse me. You've traveled enough in your time to know that most traveler's checks are better than money because if they're lost or stolen, you can easily get them replaced. But you should also know that there's one traveler's check that's better than all the others, Barclays traveler's checks. Better because there's usually a fee or service charge which must be paid when you purchase traveler's checks, but Barclays traveler's checks cost you nothing extra. No fee, no service charge, no commission. And to a traveler like you, that could come to quite a savings. And you get Barclays Traveler's Checks, of course, at the English Bank with an American accent, Barclays Bank International. Like Barclays Traveler's Checks, Barclays Bank is known and respected the world over. Barclays' new full-service Chicago bank is only one of more than 5,000 Barclays offices around the world dedicated to the financial freedom of people like you. So if you're planning a trip this summer... Stop first at Barclays for your free of commission Barclays Traveler's Checks. Barclays is located at 208 South LaSalle Street. Barclays Bank, Chicago and the world. My friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, was usually very late in the mornings save on those not too infrequent occasions when he stayed up all night. One morning, it was in the autumn of 1889, he was seated at the breakfast table in his dressing gown. I was standing on the hearth rug, looking at a stick which a visitor had left at our Baker Street rooms the night before. It was a fine, thick piece of wood, bulbous headed, of the sort that used to be known as a Penang lawyer. do you make of that stick? We missed its owner yesterday and have no idea of his errand, so this accidental souvenir assumes some importance. Let me hear you reconstruct the man by an examination of it. Just follow my method. Um, well, I... I think he's an elderly medical man. Why? Because the inscription on the silver band to James Mortimer, MRCS, from his friends of the CCH... 1884. Excellent. What else? Mm, I say he's a country practitioner who does a great deal of his visiting on foot. Oh, why then? Well, because the thick iron ferrule has been worn down and the whole stick's been terribly knocked about. <laughs> I can't see a town doctor carrying it. Perfectly sound. And what about the friends of the CCH? Well, I think that's the, um, something Hunt, uh, whatever the local Hunt's called. He's probably helped them professionally, and they gave him this stick in return. Really, Watson, you excel yourself. Most stimulating. Oh, Holmes. And now that I've finished breakfast, I'd like to have a look at that stick myself. Just hand me over my convex lens, will you? Yes. Thank you. (coughs) Now, let me see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid, my dear Watson, that most of your conclusions are erroneous. What? 
Not that you're entirely wrong. The man is certainly a country practitioner. Ah, then I was right. To that extent. Where did I go wrong, then? Well, for one thing, I would suggest that a presentation to a doctor is more likely to come from a hospital than from a hunt. And when the initial CC are placed before that hospital, the words Charing Cross naturally suggest themselves. <laughs> you may be right. The probability lies in that direction. And since the presentation was made but five years ago, there emerges a young fellow under 30, amiable, absent-minded, and with a favorite dog, something between a terrier and a mastiff. Now, now, just a minute, Holmes. How do you know he's amiable, absent-minded, and has a dog? Well, it's my experience that only amiable men receive testimonials. And he was absent-minded enough to leave his stick here yesterday. Oh, true. Well, what about the dog? Well, look at the teeth marks on the stick. I As I say, they're too broad for a terrier, not broad enough for a mastiff. Uh, let me take it over to the light. Yes. Oh, yes, by Jove, it's a, it's a curly-haired spaniel. My dear fellow, how can you possibly be sure of that? Simply by looking out of the window. Oh. Dog <laughs> and owner are on our very doorstep. <laughs> uh, he's a tall, thin man, a bit bent at the shoulders. Oh, yes, and his frock coat's a bit worn. Come in. Ah, you have my stick. <laughs> I'm so very glad. I wasn't sure whether I'd left it here or in the shipping office. I wouldn't use that stick for the world. A presentation, I see. Uh, yes, sir. From Charing Cross Hospital? Uh, yes. <laughs> ah, then we're not so far wrong. Dr. Uh, Mortimer. James Mortimer. Yes, sir. I'm now in practice in Devon at Grimpen on Dartmoor. I came to you because I am confronted with a most serious and extraordinary problem. I have in my pocket an old manuscript. I observed it as you entered the room. It's a, a family document. It was committed to my care by Sir Charles Baskerville, who died some three months ago in Devon. Ah, oh, yes, I remember reading about that. Mr. Holmes, until his sudden and tragic death, Sir Charles was a patient and also my personal friend. He was strong-minded, shrewd, Practical and as unimaginative as I am. Oh, but he took this document very seriously and was prepared for just such an end as eventually did overtake him. What's it. in the document? A certain legend that runs in the Baskerville family. <clears throat> it tells the story of the death of Hugo Baskerville, who held the manor at the time of the Great Rebellion. Hugo, Mr. Holmes, was a wild, profane, and godless man. His name was a byword in the West. It happened that he fell in love with the daughter of a yeoman who held land near the Baskerville estate. This girl avoided him, and one Michaelmas he stole down upon the farm with five or six wicked companions and carried her off to the hall. They put her in an upper room and sat down to a long carousal. The girl, in the stress of her fear, climbed down the ivy that still covers the south wall and set off homeward across the moor. Go on. Some time later, Hugo went upstairs to see his captive and found her gone. And here I think I must quote the manuscript itself. <sighs> <clears throat> then it would seem he became as one that hath a devil, for rushing downstairs into the dining hall, he sprang upon the table, flagons and trenchers flying before him, and he cried aloud before all the company that he would that very night render his body and soul to the powers of evil, if he might but overtake the wench. <clears throat> and at that, Mr. Holmes, this wicked man ran from the house and had his groom saddle his horse and unkennel the pack. You mean you put the hounds on her? He did. He gave them the girl's handkerchief and set off full cry in the moonlight over the moor. But good heavens, didn't the others try and stop him? Well, they just seemed to have stood there, stupefied. But then some sense came back into their minds and they rode off after him. They found Hugo Baskerville's black mare dabbled with froth and riderless. Sure. They found the hounds whimpering in a cluster at the head of a dip. Three of the boldest riders, or maybe the most drunken, rode down into the dip. And there they found the unhappy girl lying dead with fear and fatigue. Poor girl. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that that raised the hair on their heads. Let me quote the actual words again. <clears throat> it was that standing over Hugo and plucking at his throat, there stood a great foul thing, a black beast, shaped like a hound, yet 
larger than any hound that mortal eye had rested upon. And even as they looked, the thing tore out the throat of Hugo Baskerville. Mm. Then, as it turned its blazing eyes and dripping jaws upon them, the three shrieked with fear and rode for dear life, still screaming across the moor. One, it is said, died that very night of what he had seen, and the other twain were but broken men for the rest of their days. <clears throat> the writer ends by counselling his descendants never to cross the moor in those dark hours, as he puts it, when the powers of evil are exalted. Great heaven. Now we come to something a little more recent. The death of Sir Charles Baskerville in June of this year. Let me say at once that Sir Charles was a man of very different mould from his infamous ancestor. Many people had good reason to bewail his untimely end. It was sudden, you say? Indeed, yes. Not that his health had been good for some time. There was an affection of the heart showing itself in breathlessness and nervous depression. Was he a married man, Dr. Mortimer? He was a widower and childless. Mm -hmm. He lived very simply. His indoor servants at Baskerville Hall consisted of a couple named Barrymore, who acted as butler and housekeeper. They corroborated my own evidence at the inquest about his health. What happened? Well, the facts are quite simple. Every night before he went to bed, Sir Charles used to walk down the famous Yew Alley of Baskerville Hall. On the 4th of June, he declared his intention of starting for London the next day and told Barrymore to pack for him. That night... He went for his walk, as usual, and never returned. Who raised the alarm? The Barrymore, the butler. He found the hall door open, became alarmed, and went out with a lantern. Halfway down you alley, there's a gate that leads out onto the moor. Sir Charles's footprints led there, and there was evidence that he had stood there for a while. Then the footprints continued, but appeared to be those of a man... Running for his life? Where did they lead? To the far end of the alley. And there the body was found. Any signs of violence? No, but the face was incredibly distorted. At first, I couldn't believe that it really was Sir Charles. How do you account for the distortion? Well, if it's a symptom that is not unusual in cases of death from cardiac exhaustion. Yes, that's true enough. Mm. The post-mortem showed a long-standing organic disease and the coroner returned a verdict in accordance. Those are the public facts. I see. Then can we now have the private one? He would never go out on the moor at night. One evening, about three weeks before he died, I drove up to his house. He was standing at his hall door. Uh, just as I was getting out of my gig, I noticed his eyes fix themselves on something over my shoulder and stare with an expression of horror. He was so excited and alarmed that I had to go down to the spot and look round. But there was nothing. I had to stay with him all the evening. That's when I suggested he should go to London. Uh, Mr. Stapleton, a mutual friend, was also very worried about him, and he agreed with me. And then, at the last instant, came this terrible catastrophe. How soon did you see the body? Well, they had to send a message over. I was there within the hour. I checked all the facts that were mentioned at the inquest, the footprints, the absence of physical injury, the facial contortion... But Barrymore made one false statement in his evidence. Oh? What was that? He said there were no traces on the ground round the body. He didn't see any. I did. Footprints? A man's or a woman? Mr. Holmes. They were the footprints of a gigantic hound. There are sheepdogs on the moor. No doubt. But this was no sheepdog. What is this alley like? Well, there are two lines of old yew hedge. Impenetrable, 12 feet high. Penetrated at one point by a wicked gate, you say? Yes, which leads on to the moor. Is there any other opening? None. Was this gate closed? Closed and padlocked. How high is it? About four feet. So anyone could have got over it? Yes. Dr. Mortimer, what made you say that Sir Charles had waited by the gate? His cigar ash. He dropped it there twice. Excellent. Watson, this is a colleague after my own heart. Mr. Holmes, several people have seen a creature on the moor. Something that couldn't be any animal known to science. A huge creature. Luminous, spectral. And you, a trained man of science, believe it to be supernatural? I don't know what to believe. 
Surely the footprints were material. The original hound was material enough to tear out a man's throat. But it was diabolical as well. Dr. Mortimer, if you hold these views, why have you come to consult me? You tell me in the same breath that it's useless to investigate Sir Charles's death and that you desire me to do it. I did not say I desired you to do it. Oh? Then how can I assist you? By telling me what to do about Sir Henry Baskerville. Sir Henry? Is this the heir? Yes. He's Sir Charles's nephew, the son of his younger brother. He's been traced in Canada. He's been farming there. He arrives at Waterloo in, uh, oh, let me see, um, just under an hour and a quarter. Are there any other claimants? No. The only other kinsman we have been able to trace was Roger Baskerville, the youngest of the three brothers of whom poor Sir Charles was the eldest. He was the black sheep of the family. The very image, so they say, of old Hugo. England became too hot for him and he died of yellow fever in Central America. Henry's own father, the middle brother, died young, so he is the last of the Baskervilles. I have had a wire to say that he arrived at Southampton this morning and I'm on my way to meet him. Mr. Holmes, what am I to do? I suggest you call here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning and bring Sir Henry with you. <laughs> I'll do that, Mr. Holmes. Uh, just one more question. You say that before Sir Charles Baskerville's death, several people saw this apparition on the moor. Yes. Did anyone see it afterwards? Not that I've heard. Thank you, Dr. Mortimer. Good day, Mr. Holmes. Good, Good day, day, Dr. Sir. Watson. Good day, Doctor. I'm very much obliged to you. Listening to The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, being brought to you from the BBC over WFMT in Chicago and presented by Barclays Bank International. Now offering Barclays Travelers checks free of commission, offering no charge checking with a $300 minimum balance, offering you always a friendly cup of tea, and if you like, for your personal checks, a cameo of Sherlock Holmes imprinted in the top left corner. Barclays Bank International at 208 South LaSalle. The next morning, our clients were punctual. As the clock struck ten, Dr. Mortimer was shown up, followed by the young baronet, a man of about thirty, sturdily built, with the weather-beaten appearance of one who spent most of his time in the open air. This is Sir Henry Baskerville. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Uh, Holmes? Sir Henry. Dr. Uh, Watson. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the strange thing is, if my friend here hadn't proposed coming around to you this morning, I'd have come on my own. Or it was this letter. If you can call it a letter. It reached me by the first post. Sir Henry Baskerville, Northumberland Hotel, Charing Cross. Who knew you were going to stay there? Well, no one. We only decided after I met Dr. Mortimer. But presumably he was already staying there. No, sir, no. I've been staying with a friend. There was no possible indication that we intended to stay at that hotel. I see. Well, somebody seems to be deeply interested in your movements. Um, may I read the letter? Oh, please do. As you'll see, it's only a single sentence. I notice it's made up of printed words pasted onto a sheet of fool's cap. Oh. As you value your life, or your reason, keep away from the moor. The word moor is written in ink. It's the only one. Now, perhaps you'll tell me what in thunder's the meaning of that. Any watermark? I wonder. No, no, I, I don't see any. Now, tell me, Sir Henry, has anything else of interest happened to you since you've been in London? Oh, no, I... I don't think so. You've not observed anyone following you or watching you? <laughs> they seem to have walked right into the thick of a dime novel. Now, why in thunder should anyone follow me or watch me? We're coming to that. You've nothing else to report to us. Well, no. Um, well, unless you think it's worth reporting that I've lost one of my boots. Have you indeed? Yes, I, I put them both outside my door last night, and there was only one there this morning. I... I couldn't get any sense out of the fellow who cleans them. It seems a singularly useless thing to steal. Oh, I told him it's bound to turn up again. Uh, now, look, gentlemen, 
it seems to me that I've spoken quite enough of the little I know. It's time you kept your promise and told me what we're all driving at. I quite agree. Dr. Mortimer, will you be good enough to tell Sir Henry your story as you told it to us? By all means. It begins, Sir Henry, with this manuscript, uh -huh. which has been in the possession of your family for generations. Well, I seem to have come into an inheritance with a vengeance. Of course, I've heard of the hound since I was in the nursery, but I never thought of taking it seriously. But as to my uncle's death, I, I, can't, I can't get it clear yet. You don't seem to have made up your minds whether it's a case for a policeman or a clergyman. Precisely. The point we have to decide now, though, Sir Henry, is whether or not it's advisable for you to go to Baskerville Hall. Why shouldn't I? There seems to be danger. You mean... Danger from the family fiend or danger from human beings? That's what we have to find out. Hmm. Well, whichever it is, my answer's fixed. There is no devil in hell, Mr. Holmes, and there is no man on earth who can stop me going to the home of my own people, and you can take that as my final answer. Bravo! <laughs> now, uh, now look, Mr. Holmes, I, I'd rather like a quiet hour to myself to think about all this. Of course. I'll, uh, I'll go back to my hotel. Uh, look, why don't you and Dr. Watson come and lunch with us there at uh, 2 o'clock? Oh, thank you. Is that convenient to you, Watson? Perfectly. Yeah. Then you may expect us. Good. Uh, shall I have a cab? Call no, me? no, no. I'd prefer to walk. If you'll join me, Dr. Mortimer? With pleasure. Well, then we'll meet again at 2. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Bye. gentlemen. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, he seems a good enough chap. Quick, Watson, while I get my frock coat. Watch at the window and see which way they go. What do you mean? A... Of course. Isn't it clear there are people up their tails? We must shatter them and see what happens. Careful, Watson. They've stopped to look in the shop window. We'd better do the same. No, wait. Look at that handsome cab. It has stopped as well. It's following them. That's our man. In the cab? Yes. Let's get a look at him. Oh, curse it. He's seen us. He's shouting to his cabby. Let's run off. Oh, useless. They've got too good a start. Oh, Watson. If you're an honest man, you can record this and set it against my successes. Who was the man? I've no idea. Did you see his face? All I saw was a big black beard. Quite so. Probably a false one to conceal his true features. He is at a disadvantage, though. You mean he's put himself in the power of the cabin? Exactly. What a pity we didn't get the number. My dear Watson, clumsy as I have been, you surely don't imagine that I neglected to get that. Uh, 2704 is our man. We must find out by wire the identity of the cabman and arrange the question. Well, what about Sir Henry and Dr. Mortimer? Oh, there's no point in following them now. Yeah. Come, Watson, the nearest telegraph office, and then we can drop into one of the Bond Street picture galleries and do that. Ah, Mr. Holmes. Sir Henry, did you know you were followed from my rooms this morning? Followed? By whom? Well, whoever he was, he informed the cabman that his name was Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Good Holmes. Uh, Dr. Mortimer, have you among your acquaintances on Dartmoor any man with a black full beard? Um, now let me see. Ah, yes. Barrymore, Sir Charles's butler. He has just such a beard. Who is this Barrymore? Oh, his family have looked after the hall for four generations now. Did Barrymore profit at all by Sir Charles's will, Sir Henry? Yes, he and his wife had, uh, what, 500 pounds each. Ah. Did they know it was coming to them? Oh, yes. Sir Charles was fond of talking about his will. Ah, that's very interesting. I hope you don't suspect everyone who received a legacy from Sir Charles. I myself was left a thousand pounds. Indeed. And anyone else? There were a number of small bequests to individuals and charities, the residue all went to Sir Henry here. Sir Henry, hmm? how much was the residue? 740,000 pounds. Oh, really? I had no idea that so gigantic a sum was involved. It's a stake for which a man might well play a desperate game. One more question, Dr. Mortimer. If anything happened to our young friend here, you'll forgive the unpleasant hypothesis, who would inherit the estate? Some distant cousins named the Desmonds. James Desmond is an elderly clergyman in Westmoreland. 
I see. Tell me, Sir Henry, huh? have the mysterious events of the last few hours caused you to change your mind about Baskerville Hall? Mr. Holmes, they have just made me all the more determined to go down there the very first moment I can. Then I only make one provision. You certainly must not go alone. Dr. Mortimer's going with me. But Dr. Mortimer has his practice to attend to, and his house is miles away from yours. With all the goodwill in the world, he may not be able to help you. No, Sir Henry, you must take somebody with you. A trusty man who'll be always by your side. Well, could you possibly come yourself, Mr. Holmes? If matters come to a crisis, I should endeavor to be present in person. But my extensive practice and the constant appeals that reach me make it impossible for me to be away from London indefinitely. Uh, no. Well, uh, whom would you recommend, then? If my friend Dr. Watson would take it, there is no man better worth having at your side when you're in a tight place. No man can say so more confidently than I. Oh, oh. Well, well, now, that's, that's real kind of you, Dr. Watson. Look, if you'll come down to Baskerville Hall and see me through... I'll never forget it. I'll come with pleasure. I, I don't know how I can employ my time better. Excellent. Now, Watson, mm -hmm. you will report very carefully to me. When a crisis comes, as it will do, I will direct you how to act. Yes, yes. Could you start by Saturday? Does that suit, Dr. Watson? Oh, perfectly. Then on Saturday, unless you hear to the contrary, we shall meet at the 10.30 train from Paris. As the train sped out of Paddington, I looked back at the tall, austere figure of Holmes gazing after us. A pleasant journey it was. And in a very few hours, the brown earth had become ruddy, the brick changed to granite. And then, over the green squares of the fields and the low curve of a wood, there rose in the distance a grey, melancholy hill with a strange, jagged summit. There you are, Sir Henry. There's your first view of the moor. Dartmoor. <laughs> you know, I've been over a good part of the world, but I've never had a moment to compare with this. This is your homecoming? Yes. Yes, but it's more than that. This is where the men of my blood have lived for centuries. Up on those moors. And up there, too, there's something that has haunted them and driven them to their death. I know one thing, gentlemen. Whatever it is that lurks up there, whether it's man or fiend, it's not driving me away. I'm going to face it and beat it. Martinique, Tanzania, Dubrovnik. Wherever your vacation plans take you this summer, Barclays Bank International has a special going-away present to make your travels completely free of money worries. Barclays Traveler's Checks. Barclays Traveler's Checks are the closest thing yet to an international common currency. They're accepted at face value throughout the world. And with over 5,000 Barclays offices around the world, all strategically located to serve you, they can easily be replaced at no cost to you should they be misplaced or stolen. Best of all, they're free at Barclays. As part of Barclays' good neighbor policy, you can get Barclays traveler's checks without paying a penny extra for commission. When you think of all the places you plan to stay, the things you plan to do, and the things you plan to buy, that could come to quite a saving. So before you leave the country, come to Barclays for your free of commission traveler's checks. Your longest... <laughs> Bitter wind, Watson. Yes. Now, where was that answering light, do you think? Uh, further up, I feel sure, by the Neolithic hut circle. Good heavens! 
What's that, Watson? I don't know. I, I heard it once before. It's, it's a sound they have on the moor. Watson, it was the cry of a hound. The hound of the Baskervilles. Even to this day, I tremble when I recall those words. My name is Watson, Dr. Watson, and it was my privilege to share the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. I'll just refresh your memory on events so far, and then we'll tell you what happened next concerning the Hound of the Baskervilles. When Dr. Mortimer had finished his strange story of the Hound of the Baskervilles, and how Sir Charles had met his death, my friend Sherlock Holmes persuaded Dr. Mortimer and me to accompany Sir Henry Baskerville to the ancestral home on Dartmoor. While Holmes remained behind in Baker Street, we soon found ourselves driving across the moor to Baskerville Hall. Wonderful country, isn't it, Doctor? Very beautiful. There's autumn in the air, though. <laughs> Hello? What's this? Uh, what's, what? what's the matter? Look, up there on the skylight. Huh? Oh, uh, a man on horseback. Oh, uh, with a rifle. Oh, uh, there's a convict escaped from the prison, sir. Oh? Been out there three days now. Warders are watching every road. They've had no sign of him yet. Farmers back here don't like it, sir, and that's a fact. Well, who is he, then? Southern, the Notting Hill murderer. Southern? <laughs> and he's somewhere out there, hiding in a burrow like a wild beast. Mm. That's all this more needs, gentlemen. I don't know if it's my imagination, but it's getting mighty cold. Welcome, Sir Henry. Welcome to Baskerville Hall. Thank you. You are uh, Barrymore, I take it? I am, Sir Henry. I see. Uh, doctor, will you stay for dinner? Uh, no, thank you, if you don't mind. My wife will be expecting me. Mm -hmm. I'd stay to show you over the house, but Barrymore will be a better guy than I. Very well. Uh, Perkins. Uh, Perkins, take uh, Dr. Mortimer on with you. We're all well, then, Doctor, and thank you for all the help you've given. Oh, Doctor, it's just as I imagined it. Rafters... Oak paneling, stag's heads, coats of arms. Isn't it the very picture of an old family home? Yeah. And my people have lived here for 500 years. Excuse me, Sir Henry. Hmm. Yes, Barrymore? Uh, sir, huh? my wife and I will be happy to stay with you until you've made fresh arrangements. Fresh arrangements? Do you mean your wife and you want to leave? Only when it's quite convenient to use her. Well, I'd uh, be sorry to start my life here by breaking an old family connection. I feel that too, sir. And so does my wife. Well, then what's the trouble? Uh, to tell the truth, sir, we were both very much attached to Sir Charles, and his death gave us a shock and made these surroundings very painful to us. I'm afraid we could never be easy in our minds at Baskerville Hall again. What do you plan to do? Well, I've no doubt, sir, we shall succeed in establishing ourselves in some business. Sir Charles's generosity has given us the means to do it. I see. And now, sir, perhaps I'd better show you to your room. Dr. Watson. Oh, morning, Sir Henry. Did you happen to hear someone sobbing in the night? Well, that's curious. I, I thought it was all a dream. I heard it quite distinctly. A woman sobbing. Good morning, gentlemen. Oh, oh uh, there I am. It's a very good breakfast. Uh, tell me, we both thought we heard a woman crying in the night. Do you know anything about it? No, Sir Henry. There are only two women here at night. One is the scullery maid who sleeps in the west wing, and the other is my wife. It certainly wasn't her. Can I bring you more coffee, sir? No, thank you. Very good, Sir Henry. I don't believe him. Why not? I passed Mrs. Barrymore on my way downstairs. Her eyes were red and swollen. It must have been her. Do you think it was him following me in that cab in Regent Street? 
No, we'll soon find out. Oh, how? When we left you after lunch in London, Holmes sent a telegram to Barrymore with strict instructions that it was to be delivered personally to Barrymore or returned. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd walk over to Grimpen Post Office and have a word with the postmaster. He'll give me something to report to Holmes. Do you feel like a walk? Uh, no, no, no. I've got a lot of papers to attend to here. You go on your own. I'll see you back here for lunch. <laughs> Really, sir. My boy took the telegram and gave it to Mrs. Barrymore. Why not to Mr. Barrymore himself, uh, as he instructed? He was up in the loft at the time. Did anyone see him? Well, surely his wife ought to know where he is. He got the telegram, didn't he? If there's any mistake, it's for Mr. Barrymore to complain. Uh, uh, excuse me, but uh, isn't this Dr. Watson? Uh, yes, but uh, I don't think I'd uh, Allow me to introduce myself. Stapleton of oh. Merripit House. Oh, uh, Stephen, how, how, how do you do, sir? I hope Sir Henry is none the worse for his journey. He's very well, thank you. Excellent. Uh, are you going back to Baskerville Hall now, Doctor? That was my intention. Then our roads lie together. And just over there, you you can see the plume of smoke from here. Mm. That's where I live, uh, Mary Pitt House. Oh. It's only a moderate walk from the moor path. If yes. you've a few minutes to spare, I should appreciate the honor of introducing you to my sister. I should be delighted. Oh, come along, then. wonderful place, the moor. Uh, you never tire of it. Uh, you can't think what secrets it contains. You know it well, then. I've been here two years. The residents call me a newcomer. But my tastes led me to explore every part of the country round. As you can see, I, I'm a naturalist. Mm. Some of the locals laugh at my butterfly net and this tin I always carry with me. Oh, let me not. So, although I've only recently come here, I shoot things for a few men who know the moor better than I do. But is it so hard to know? Very hard. For instance... You see that great plain to the north with the hills behind it? That is the great Wimpen Mire. A full step there means death to man or beast. It's dangerous to cross, even in the dry seasons. But after these autumn rains, it's an awful place. Yet I can find my way to the very heart of it and come back alive. But why should you want to go to such a dreadful place? Uh, well, you, you see the hills beyond? There are really islands cut off on all sides by the mire uh, which crawl round in the course of years. I see, yes. That is where the rare plants and butterflies are. There are one or two paths that an active man can take. Well, I'll try my luck someday. For God's sake, put such an idea out of your mind. You wouldn't have a chance. It's only by remembering very complex landmarks that I can do it. Good heavens, what was that? Queer well, place, the moor. Yeah, what is it, man? The peasants say it's the hound of the Baskervilles calling for its prey. It's the weirdest thing I ever heard in my life, and even in India. Well, yes, it's, you know, it's rather an uncanny place altogether. Look at that hillside. Mm -hmm. What do you make of those circular wings of stone? What are they? Sheep pens? No, they're the homes of our worthy ancestors. <laughs> it's quite a town. When was it inhabited? A Neolithic man. No date. Oh, oh excuse me. Uh, did you see that butterfly? It's a Cyclopides. Uh, very rare. You scarcely ever see them in autumn. Uh, I must try and get it. I say, Mr. Stavlin, do be careful or you'll tell me how dangerous it... Well, I suppose he knows what he's doing. Sir. Good heavens, I didn't hear it. Go back. Go straight back to London. Why, 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 why should I go back? I can't explain, but for God's sake, do what I ask you. Go back and never set foot on the moor again. But I've only just come. Oh, my brother's coming back. Not a word of what I said. <laughs> Would you mind getting me that orchid among the mare's tails? We're very rich in orchids on the moor, though it's getting rather late for them. Devil? You've introduced yourselves, I see. Yes, I was telling Sir Henry that the orchids are nearly over. That's not Sir Henry Baskerville. No, no, no only a humble commoner. I'm his friend, Dr. Watson. Then we've been talking at cross purposes. Why, you hadn't very much time for talk. I talked as if Dr. Watson were a resident instead of just a visitor. It can't matter to him whether it's early or late for orchids. Well, never mind. Do please come and see Meredith's house, Doctor. No, really, thank you. I, I, I promise, Sir Henry. It must be a pleasure deferred. Uh, au revoir, Dr. Watson. Goodbye, sir. Come, Bellow. Uh, my dear Holmes, I've waited until tonight to finish this letter to you, as I did not wish to arouse uh, Henry's curiosity or alarm. I mentioned to him that I'd met the Stapletons, but not that she had whispered to me this strange warning, even that I was Sir Henry myself. Stapleton, I learned, was a schoolmaster in the north whose school was running well till an epidemic killed three of the boys 
Fortunately, he never recovered from the blow. Sir Henry's in excellent spirits. We've been sitting over the fire and talking with the portraits of the Baskerville ancestors looking down on us. It's now nearly two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Who's that? Ah, Sir Henry. Anything wrong? I'm not sure. There was a creaking in the passage outside. I saw a candle and a shadow. Well, let's go and see. Yes. There you are. There's a light in one of those rooms. Who is it? Barrymore. What's he doing? He seems to be signaling with a candle, I should think, and staring out over the world. <laughs> Dear Holmes, little more of consequence to report this morning. No more nocturnal wanderings. And today, Mr. Stapleton and his handsome sister are joining us for luncheon, Dr. Mortimer. Good evening. Dear Holmes, a new complication. If we had not enough, Sir Henry has shown an obvious attachment to Mr. Stapleton's sister. This was clear enough at our first luncheon party, of which I wrote to you earlier, and equally clear was Mr. Stapleton's hostility. Now the thing has moved further. A meeting on the moors between Sir Henry and the sister, interrupted with angry words by the jealous Mr. Stapleton. Otherwise, nothing, but we listen every night for Barrymore to repeat his strange behavior. This is not yours. But then by Sunday you'll leave my employment in the morning. Come, Watson. Bring your revolver. I have it with you. I'm going to take that man out there, whoever he may be. Oh, this is bitter wind, Watson. Now, yeah. well, where was that answering light, do you think? Uh, further up, I feel sure, by the Neolithic hut circle. Good heavens! What's that, Watson? I don't know. I, I heard it once before. It's, it's a sound they have on the moor. Watson, it was the cry of a hound. The hound of the Baskervilles. Now, Barrymore, to whom were you signaling? Dr. Watson and I go out into the moor and find some filthy remnants of food and shelter. Who left them there? Don't ask me, Sir Henry. Don't ask me. I, I give you my word, sir. It's not my secret. I thunder, Barrymore. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? Your family has lived with mine under this roof for over a hundred years. And here I find you deep in some plot against me. No. No, sir. Not against you. Mrs. Barrymore. Why have you come here? Oh, let me speak. It's my doing, Sir Henry. He's done nothing except for my sake. I asked him to do it. Well, speak out, then. What does it mean? My brother is starving out there on the moor. Your, your brother? We can't let him perish at our very gate, sir. Our light is a signal. We have food for him. Then your brother is... The, the escaped convict, sir. Selden... The criminal. It's terrible. Well, well, is this true, Barrymore? It is, Sir Henry, every word of it. Well, I, I, I can't blame you for standing by your own vice, but you must see the man's a public danger. In a very few days, sir, he'll be on his way to South America. If he can only lie quiet till the ship's ready for him. I beg you not to let the police know he's still on the moor. <laughs> what do you say, Watson? Well, if you were safely out of the country, it would relieve the taxpayer of a burden. Yes, that's true, I suppose. I guess we're aiding and abetting a felony, eh, Watson? Yes, I'm afraid so. All the same, I... Well, I, I don't feel now I can get the man up and 
That's an endo. Oh, sir. Uh, sir Henry. Yes? What is it now? You've been so kind to us, sir, that I I should like to do the best I can in return. I I know something. What do you mean? It's about poor Sir Charles's death, sir. What? Do you know how he died? No, sir, I don't know that. Or what then? I know why he was at the gate. Why? To meet a woman. A woman? Yes, sir. Well, what was her name? Well, I can't give you that, sir, but I can give you her initials. They were L.L. L. How do you know that? Well, sir, your uncle had a letter that morning. It was from Coon Tracy, an addressed in a woman's hand. Well? well I thought no more of the letter, sir, but the other day my wife was cleaning out Sir Charles's study, and she found the ashes of a burned letter in the back of the grate. Most of it was charred to pieces, but there was just one slip you could still read. Well, what did it say? It said, please, please, as you are a gentleman, burn this letter and be at the gate by ten o'clock. And the initials were L.L. And you've no idea who L.L. is? No, sir. Hmm. Very good, Barrymore. You and your wife may go. Thank you, sir. And God bless you, sir. L.L. L.L. Hello. Been taking a walk? Yes, I've been right around the black tor. Oh, let me give you a little tone then. Oh, oh thank you. Yep. Uh, I'm very upset, Dr. Watson. My spaniel has disappeared. Oh, oh yes, little curly-haired chap. Wandered off into the moor and never came back. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, any news of Sherlock Holmes? No, very little. He acknowledges my reports. He doesn't say much... Who oh, brought him up? Uh, you know, is there a woman living around here with the initials LL? Not that I know of. LL. Oh, wait a minute. Yes, of course there is. Laura Lyons of Queen Tracy. Who is she? Oh, married some artist fellow called Lyons who came sketching on the moors. He walked out on her and now the poor girl hasn't a penny. How does she live? Oh, several of us have helped her. Stapleton, Sir Charles, so have I. She's managed to start a little typewriting business. Why do you ask? Oh, just curiosity. <laughs> Mrs. Lyons? Uh, I don't think we've met, Mr... Uh, Doctor. Doctor Watson. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? It was about the late Sir Charles Baskerville that I've come to see you... What can I tell you about him? You knew him, didn't you? Yes. I owe a great deal to his kindness. Did you correspond with him? What is the object of this interrogation? To avoid a public scandal. Yes. I did write once or twice to Sir Charles to acknowledge his generosity. How did he know enough about your affairs to be able to help you? Through my friend, Mr. Stapleton. Did you ever write to Sir Charles asking him to meet you? Surely, sir. Uh, certainly not. Not on the very day of Sir Charles's death? No. Surely your memory deceives you. Didn't you write, please, please burn this letter and be at the gate by ten o'clock? Yes. I believe that if I could see him, I could gain his help. Well, what happened when you got there? I never went. Mrs. Lyons. I swear it on all I hold sacred. Something intervened to prevent my going. What? You probably know that I made a rash marriage and have had reason to regret it. Yes, I've heard something of the kind. My husband has made my life one incessant persecution. Oh, dear. I'd learned that there was a possibility of regaining my freedom if certain expenses could be met. Mm. And I thought that if Sir Charles heard the story from my own lips, he might help me. Then why didn't you go? Because I received help in the interval... Uh, from another source. Then why didn't you write to Sir Charles and explain... I was going to. Then the next morning, I heard that he had died. Oh, Watson, I, I thought you got lost on the moors. Uh, uh, Come on, your lunch is waiting for you. Well, thank you. No, 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 I didn't get lost. I... I was driving back from Mrs. Lyons, and Mortimer stopped me, said he'd forgotten to tell me that he has observed a boy 
go up every day towards those stone huts on the hill. Regular stockwork. That's odd. Oh, uh, Barrymore. Dr. Watson's here now. Very good, sir. Oh, and Barrymore. Do you know anything about a boy going up on the moors? Is he anything to do with that, uh, that precious relation of yours? Uh, no, sir. I think he takes food to that other man. What other, other man? man? I don't know, sir. Selden says he's not a convict. He says he's living in one of those stone huts, and the boy brings him up food from one of the villages. But he doesn't know who he is? No, sir. He doesn't like it. Neither do we, sir, I can tell you. Waiting for something, he seems to be. There's foul play somewhere, yeah. sir, I'll swear it. Who on earth can it be? Do you think it's that same fellow who was following your bag in London? Ah. I'd better send a report by telegraph. Now, I'll do better than that. I'll go up onto the moor this evening. Oh, I'll come with you. No, I can't permit it. Huh? That was Holmes's last word to me. Keep him off the moor, especially after dark. And it'll be close on dark by the time I get there. Look, my dear fellow. Don't worry, I'll... don't worry. I'll take my revolver. Oh, I can look after myself. Do you realize, Sir Henry, this fellow may be the key to the whole mystery? He gave us the slip in Regent Street thanks to his handsome cab. Well, he won't do it up there. <laughs> Who knows? For once I may succeed where Eden Holmes has failed. With tingling nerves, I sat in the dark recesses of the hut and waited for the coming of its tenant. And then, at last, I heard it. It's a lovely evening, wasn't it? I really think you'd be more comfortable outside than in. Holmes! Holmes! And please be careful with that revolver. Oh, my dear Holmes, I was never more mad to see anyone in my life. How did you know I was in there? Watson, if you seriously desire to surprise me, you must change your tobacconist. Oh, my cigarette in? Yes. You threw it down, no doubt, at that supreme moment when you charged into the empty house. But Holmes, how in the name of wonder did you get here? I thought you were in Baker Street working on that case of blackmailing. That was what I wished you to do. I've been over to see a Mrs. Laura Lyons at Coombe Tracy. Well done. We've obviously been working on parallel lines. What did you learn? Well, she made an appointment with Sir Charles at the gate. She admits that. Sir? Uh, she wanted money to help her divorce. But what? she never went. Something happened to make her change her mind, but she wouldn't tell me what. She also said that she first got in touch with Sir Charles through Stapleton. Ah, now that's important. It bridges the gap. You're aware, I suppose, that there's a close intimacy between the lady and Stapleton. Oh, I didn't know that. There's no doubt about it. Now, this puts a very powerful weapon into our hands. If I can only use it to detach Stapleton's wife. His wife? Why, yes. The lady who passes for his sister is his wife. Good heavens, why the elaborate deception? Because he foresaw that she'd be more used to him as a free woman. Then, is he our enemy? Was it he who dogged us in London? So I read the riddle. Stapleton. And the warning letter, that must have come from her. Exactly. But Holmes, how do you know this woman is his wife? Because he so far forgot himself as to give you a true piece of autobiography when he first met you. There's no one easier to trace than a schoolmaster. Then what staple than after? It is murder, Watson. Refined, cold-blooded, deliberate murder. Listen! My God, what's that? Where is it? The hound! Three heavens of where too late! Come, Watson, come! <laughs> of the Baskervilles is one of the most famous stories of Sherlock Holmes from the inspired pen of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. We are presenting it in three parts, and you have just heard part two. My name in real life is Norman Shelley. My old colleague, Carlton Hobbs, played Sherlock Holmes, and I was Dr. Watson. Felix Felton wrote the script for this BBC production from London. I look forward to the pleasure of your company again very soon. Oh,
part three of the Hound of the Baskervilles. WFMT 98.7 FM, Chicago, Chicago's fine art station. Barclays Bank International, now open at 208 South LaSalle Street in Chicago, the English bank with an American accent, presents on WFMT, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Tonight we have the third and final segment of The Hound of the Baskervilles. It is murder, Watson. Refined, cold-blooded, deliberate murder. Listen! My God, what's that? Where is it? The hounds! Great heavens, if we're too late, come, Watson, come! It was a race against time, against evil, against I knew not what. In this, the most uncanny of all Sherlock Holmes cases. Watson is my name, Dr. Watson. And I shared the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And since in my excitement I may have anticipated somewhat, let me first go back and recall the chain of detection that led Holmes to this crisis. And then I will tell you what happened finally in our encounter with the Hound of the Baskervilles. Martinique, Tanzania, Dubrovnik. Wherever your vacation plans take you this summer, Barclays Bank International has a special going-away present to make your travels completely free of money worries. Barclays Traveler's Checks. Barclays Traveler's Checks are the closest thing yet to an international common currency, accepted at face value throughout the world. And with over 5,000 Barclays offices around the world, all strategically located to serve you. They can easily be replaced at no cost to you should they be misplaced or stolen. Best of all, they're free at Barclays. As part of Barclays' good neighbor policy, you can get Barclays Traveler's Checks without paying a penny extra for commission. And when you think of all the places you plan to stay, the things you plan to do, and the things you plan to buy, that could come to quite a savings. So before you leave the country, come to Barclays, for your free of commission traveler's checks. Your longest journey can begin with one short stop to Barclays Bank. 208 South LaSalle Street, Chicago, and the world. Holmes and I had come to Dartmoor to protect Sir Henry from the terrible fate which might befall him if the legend of the Baskervilles came true. But Holmes was convinced that behind it all was cold-blooded, deliberate murder by Stapleton, the apparently mild lepidopterist schoolmaster. Our nets were closing on the murderer. Even the Stapletons were closing on his victim. Sir Henry Baskerville. We were just about to leave the lonely hut where Holmes had been in hiding for all these days when... The hound! Great heavens if we're too late! Come, Watson, come! <laughs> you hear that? He's beaten us, Watson. Oh, no, surely not. Fool that I was to hold my hand, and you, want. He will come from abandoning your charge. Why, heaven, if the worst has happened, we'll avenge him. Come quickly, let's find him. Yes. Yes. It's Sir Henry, poor devil. Do you remember that the suit he wore when he first came to our rooms in Baker? Oh, his skull's crushed. Oh, the brute! Holmes, I shall never forgive myself. I'm more to blame than you, Watson. But how could I know that he'd risked his life on the moor in the face of all my warnings? Where's this brute of a hound that drove him to death? 
He may be lurking among the rocks at this very moment. Where's Stapleton? He shall answer for this. He shall. I'll see to that. Uh, the light in his cottage. Why don't we go and seize him at once? No. Our case is not complete. One false move and he may escape us yet. All we can do now is to perform the last offices for our poor friend. Come on, Watson. Yes. Help me to turn him over on his back. And then we can... <laughs> Good heavens, Holmes, are you mad? Watson, look! This man has a beard. A beard? It's not the baronet at all. It. Why? It's my neighbor, the convict. The suit. It's Sir Henry's, you said so. Oh, of course, now I see it. He gave Barrymore some of these suits, and Barrymore must have passed them on to Selden. Then the clothes have been the poor fellow's death. Oh. Obviously, the hound was laid on from some article of Sir Henry's. The boot that was stolen at the hotel. Probably. Hello, Watson. Hmm? What's this? Here's Stapleton himself by all that's wonderful and audacious. Careful now, not a word to show your suspicion. Why, Dr. Watson? Well, that's you, is it not? But dear me, what, what's this? Uh, somebody hurt? Not... Don't tell me it's our friend, Sir Henry. What a terrible... Who's this? Selden. The man who escaped from Princeton. Oh, dear me, but, uh, but how? He appears to have broken his neck by falling over these rocks. My friend and I were strolling on the moor when we heard a cry. Oh, so did I. That's what brought me out. I was uneasy about Sir Henry. Why about Sir Henry in particular? Because I had suggested he should come over. I see. What's your theory of this poor fellow's death, Mr. Holmes? Huh. You are quick at identification. We've been expecting you in these parts since Dr. Watson came down. You're in time to see a tragedy. Yes, indeed. I shall take an unpleasant remembrance back with me to London tomorrow. Oh, you'll return tomorrow. That is my intention. And I must return to my sister. She'll be nervous there on her own. Uh, good night, then, Mr. Holmes. Goodbye, sir. Uh, good night, Dr. Watson. Well, sir. What a nerve the fellow has. <laughs> We're at close grips at last. I'm sorry he's seen you. So was I at first, but there was no getting out of it. How will it affect him, do you think? It may make him more cautious, or it may drive him to desperate measures. Mm -hmm. Like most clever criminals, he may be too confident and imagine he's completely deceived us. What will you do now? Come up to the hall? Yes. Yes, I see no reason for further concealment. Mm. But one last word, Watson. Say nothing of the hound to Sir Henry. Let him think Seldon's death was a staple to the heaven's belief. When we arrived, I had the unpleasant task of breaking the news of Seldon's death to the Barrymore's. Sir Henry raised his eyebrows when he found that Holmes had no luggage and no explanation for his absence. But, but between us, we soon supplied his wants and sat down to a belated supper. Sir Henry, hmm? I don't suppose you appreciate that we've been mourning over you under the impression you'd broken your neck. What's that? This poor wretch was dressed in your clothes. I fear your servant who gave them to him may be in trouble with the police. Oh. Oh, no, I, I don't think so. There was no mark on them, as far as I know. That's lucky for him. How about the case? If you can muzzle that hound and put him on a chain, I'll be ready to swear that you're the greatest detective of all time. I think I can do it. If you give me your help... I'll do whatever you tell me. Very good. I shall ask you to do it blindly, without asking the reason. Just as you like. If you'll do this, I think the chances are that... What's the matter, Holmes? Uh... I, I was admiring your family portrait. They are all family portraits, I presume. Hmm? Uh, yes, uh, every one. Barrymore's been coaching me in them. Who's the gentleman with the black velvet and the lace? Ah. That's the cause of all the mischief. The wicked Hugo, who started the Hound of the Baskervilles. We're not likely to forget him. Dear me. He seems a quiet... Meek mannered man, but I dare say there was a lurking devil in his eyes. Well, I, 
I, I think we could manage another bottle of hock, don't you? Oh, thank you. I'll go and fetch it from the cellar. I won't bother Barrymore tonight. His wife's so upset with the news about Selden. What's the thing? That portrait of Hugo Baskerville. Look at it carefully. Is it like anyone you know? Oh, God heavens, it's stapled. Ah, it might be his portrait. Yes, it's an interesting example of a throwback, both physical and spiritual. The fellow's a basketball. Clearly. With designs on the succession. Yes. We have him, Watson. We have him. <laughs> Here we are. Well, you look like a general planning a battle with his chief of staff. That's exactly the situation. Oh. Well, what are my orders? Uh, I understand uh, that tomorrow night you are engaged to dine with the Stapleton. Yes. Yes, they're, uh, they're very hospitable people. Oh, well, thank you. I, I hope you'll come too. Oh, I'm afraid Watson and I must go to London. To, to London? Tomorrow? My dear fellow, you must trust me implicitly. Uh, tell your friends that we should have been happy to come with you, but that urgent business has called us to town. Will you give them that message? Well... If you insist, Mr. Holmes. Uh, one more direction. I want you to drive to Mary Pitt House, but send your trap back and let them know you intend to walk home. What's that, home? Walk home alone across the moor? Yes. But that's the very thing you told me not to do. This time you must. But whatever you do, stick to the path that leads from Mary Pitt House to the Grimpen Road. Don't leave that path for an instant as you value your life. The next morning, the trap took us to the station of Coombe Tracy. But instead of taking the train, Holmes inquired at the station master's office and was given a telegram. What have you got there, Holmes? Ah. Capital. Listen, Watson. Mm -hmm. Wire received. Coming down with unsigned warrant. Arrived 540 Lestrade. You've sent for Lestrade? Yes. He's the best of the professionals. I think we may need him. So we're not going to London? No. But everything depends on Sir Henry believing that we have gone. All we have to do is to keep out of the way. And I think we might well employ our time by calling on your acquaintance, Mrs. Laura Lyon. When she learns of the deception that Stapleton practiced on her, I think the result may be of interest to her. His wife? What do you mean, his wife? Mr. Stapleton is not a married man. I'm afraid you're mistaken, Mrs. Lyle. Prove it to me. Prove it to me, and if you can... I've come prepared to do so. Here is a photograph of the couple taken in York four years ago. Let me see. It's endorsed Mr. and Mrs. Vandeleur. Oh. oh, Mr. Holmes. Ask me what you like. I'll hold nothing back. Very well. Was the sending of the letter to Sir Charles suggested to you by Stapleton? He dictated it. So that you could meet the legal expenses of your divorce? Yes. And then, after you had sent the letter, he dissuaded you from keeping the appointment? Yes. He told me it would hurt his self-respect if anyone else found the money. And later, after Sir Charles's death, he made you remain silent about your appointment? He said that if I spoke, I should be suspected of murder. Well, I think on the whole, you've had a very fortunate escape. You had him in your power, and he knew it. And yet you're alive. <laughs> I still can't believe it. I assure you, Mrs. Lyons, for several months, you've been walking on the edge of a precipice. Now I must wish you good. You're listening to The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, being brought to you from the BBC over WFMT in Chicago, presented by Barclays Bank International, now offering Barclays Traveler's Checks free of commission, offering no-charge checking with a $300 minimum balance, offering you always a friendly cup of tea, and if you like, for your personal checks, a cameo of Sherlock Holmes imprinted on the top left corner. Barclays Bank 
International at 208 South LaSalle. There he is. Good evening, Miss Fade. Pardon, Holmes. Good evening to you. Good evening, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Miss Fade? Got anything good, gentlemen? The biggest thing for years. Well, we have uh, two hours before we need think of starting. I think we might employ it in getting some dinner, don't you? Well, suits me. And then, Lestrade, we'll take the London fog out of your throat by giving you a breath of the pure night air of Dartmoor. Well, I've never been on Dartmoor. Well, I don't suppose you'll forget your first visit. Oh. Come along. Now, I'll lead the way along the moor path. Right. I must ask you to walk on tiptoe and not to raise your voices. on earth I didn't bargain for. Serious, Holmes? Very serious indeed. It could ruin all our plans. What? What's the time? Uh, ten, ten o'clock. It can't be long now. His life depends on his coming out before the fog is over that path. If he isn't out in a few minutes, the path will be covered. We shan't be able to see our hands in front of us. Why? Why doesn't he come? Door, you're coming now. Shh. Quiet. Here he comes. Shall we call to him? No. Have your pistols ready. What? Come. Have a little more. Oh, my God. What was it? 
Whatever it was, it's dead. We've laid the family ghost once and for all. Look at the size of the brute. Oh, those dreadful flames. Even now, the mouth's on fire. And the eyes. Look at the eyes. Oh, don't worry. It's phosphorus. Look, I've got it in my fingers now. Oh, phosphorus? Yes. And a very cunning preparation of it. There's no smell to interfere with the animal's power of scent. Oh, Sir Henry, we owe you a deep apology. I was prepared for a hound, but not for such a creature as this. You saved my life. Having first in danger. What? Give me another mouthful of that brandy. Come on, here we are. That's it. Oh, that's better. That's better. Now, Come you'll on. help me up a little. Yes, uh, 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 stand away. Yes, thank you. What do you propose to do now? To leave you here. Mm. You're not fit for further adventure tonight. If you wait, one or other of us will go back with you to the hall. Right. Now, we must finish our work. We have our case. We only want our man. Watson, the strayed, right. come along. Yes. Every moment of importance. To merit me, Watson. As I thought, not a sign of him. He'll have heard our shot and escaped. Oh, this door's locked. Keep still. Listen. Huh? Do you hear that? Stand aside and be ready to rush in. I'm going to kick this lock in. <coughs> oh, Mrs. Chapel. Oh, the poor wretch. Oh. Quick, Watson. Help me untie. Get that gag out of our mouth. Yes. Oh. Holmes. Oh, look at that whiplash on her neck. The brute. Yeah, oh. madam. Sip this brandy. But he, but he escaped. He cannot escape us, madam. No, no, I mean Sir Henry. Yes. And the hound's dead. Thank God. Thank God. Oh, oh. See how he's treated me. I hate him. I hate him. Then help us. Tell us where we can find him. There's only one place he can have fled to. The old tin mine. Where? On an island in the heart of the mire. That's where he kept the hound, and that's where he'll be. But look at the fog. No one could find his way into Grimpen Mire tonight. Yes, he couldn't see the guy he wanted tonight. How do you mean that? We planted them together to mark the pathway through the mire. I see. Oh, if only I could have plucked them out today. Then you'd have him at your mercy. Well, it's no use our going after him till the fog lifts. Lestrade, will you stay on here? Certainly, Mr. Holmes. Watson, we must take Sir Henry back to Baskerville Hall. Mrs. Stapleton, if the weather is cleared, we will call to you tomorrow morning. The next morning, Mrs. Stapleton guided Holmes, Lestrade, and myself to the edge of the bog. We left her standing on the firm, peaty soil and began to follow the small wands that showed the zigzagging path through the foul quagmire. Its grip clutched at our heels as we walked. As if some malignant hand were tugging us down. Where? Where the early there, Watson? Yeah, there comes the ladder, illustrate. Yeah. Give me a good firm London pavement every time. Hello? What? Huh? Look, Watson. There, there's something in the mud. Just. Just to the right there. Yeah. I'll leave it home, you'll get caught. Look at this. An old boot. Why risk your life for that, sir? Look at the maker's name, Watson. Yes. Myers, Toronto. Exactly. Wasn't that worth a mud bath? Oh, sir. Sir Henry's missing boot. The one that was stolen from his London hotel. Stapleton must have used it to set the hound on his track and then thrown it away in his flight when he knew the game was up. you as far as here, then. Yes. Come on. Let's see what else we can learn. But more than that, we were never destined to know. When we reached the firmer ground, we looked eagerly about us. There were many traces of Stapleton's habitation. The chain where the animal was kept, 
the bones that it gnawed, the remains even of Mortimer's poor little curly-haired sparrow, and the tin of luminous paint that had been used to make the house glow with fire. But of the man himself, no sign met our eyes. If the earth told a true story, then he never reached that island of refuge. Somewhere in the foul slime of Grimpen Mire, this cold and cruel-hearted man is forever buried. Towards the end of November, Sir Henry Baskerville and Dr. Mortimer were in London on the first stage of a voyage round the world to calm Sir Henry's shattered nerves. They called on us one raw and foggy afternoon, and the four of us sat and talked round a cheerful fire in our sitting room in Baker Street. You know, Mr. Holmes, there are still one or two things about the case that puzzle me. I'll do my best to clarify them. Well, was Stapleton really a relative of mine? Oh, yes, beyond all question. He was the son of Roger Baskerville, old Sir Charles's younger brother, who fled under a cloud to South America. Ah, and Mrs. Stapleton? She was a Costa Rican beauty by name Beryl Garcia. He stole some money, changed his name to Vandeleur, and brought her to England with him. And was his knowledge of Lepidoptera all a pretense? He seemed such an expert. No, that was the one true thing about him. The British Museum recognized him as an authority. Why, he even has a moth named after him. <laughs> the Vandeleur. Really? Tell me, where on earth did he find that fearsome hound? In London. He bought it from Ross and Mangles, the dealers in Fulham Road. He took it down by the North Devon line and walked it over the moor so as to get it home without exciting notice. Mm -hmm. But then one thing upset his plan. He had to decoy Sir Charles onto the moor at night, but his wife refused to help it. Threats and, even I'm sorry to say, blows failed to move her. So, as we know, he laid his plot with Mrs. Laura Lyons. But did neither of these ladies suspect anything? Probably both did. But they were both under his influence. And his main accomplice was a dumb animal who could never give him away. Indeed. Then your arrival on the scene, Sir Henry, brought him to London with his wife. He dared not leave her behind. Then she sent me that note of warning. Yes. I knew all along that it had been sent by a woman. How could you know that? Do you remember when I examined that piece of notepaper for watermark? Yes. In doing so, I was conscious of the scent known as white jessamine. It's very necessary for the criminal expert to be able to distinguish between the 75 perfumes. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, tell me, was Mrs. Stapleton in love with her husband? She certainly feared him. She may have loved him. The two are by no means incompatible. But on the day of the crisis, she turned against him. Well, now, gentlemen, may I suggest that for the rest of the evening, we turn our thoughts into more pleasant channels. <laughs> yes, I, I have a box for Lee you know. Oh, have you heard the Dureskis? No, no, I don't. Yes, we can stop at my <laughs> Traveled enough in your time to know that most travelers' checks are better than money, because if they're lost or stolen, you can easily get them replaced. But you should also know there is one traveler's check that's better than all the others, Barclays' traveler's checks. Better because there's usually a fee or service charge which must be paid when you purchase traveler's checks. But Barclays' traveler's checks cost you nothing extra, no fee, no service charge, no commission. And to a traveler like you, that could come to quite a saving. And you get Barclays Traveler's Checks, of course, at the English bank with an American accent, Barclays Bank International. Like Barclays Traveler's Checks, Barclays Bank is known and respected the world over. Barclays' new full-service Chicago bank is only one of more than 5,000 Barclays offices around the world, dedicated to the financial freedom of people like you. So if you're planning a trip this summer... 
Stop first at Barclays for your free of commission Barclays Traveler's Checks. Barclays is located at 208 South LaSalle Street, Barclays Bank, Chicago, and the world. The Hound of the Baskervilles is one of the most famous of the stories of Sherlock Holmes by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And now you've heard part three, you know how it ended. My name in real life is Norman Shelley. My friend Carlton Hobbs played Sherlock Holmes, and I was Dr. Watson. Felix Felton wrote the script for this production by the BBC from London. And of course, I look forward to the pleasure of your company again very soon for more of the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. This concludes our three-part presentation of The Hound of the Baskervilles, and it also concludes...